speaker, and we're lucky to have a main speaker, a uh, graduate of the University of Evansville. That's over on Lincoln Avenue, uh, right on Weinbach and Lincoln. Uh, anyway, uh, we'll introduce him in a little bit more depth in a second, but things coming in the future, two weeks from day, uh, Sean Georges, he's our new executive director, and he's off another part of the country giving a talk on leadership, and uh, we have a book that he just wrote on leadership, and I've read, I'm into page 30 or 40, but it's an awful good book on leadership, so uh, he's bringing the bar up. I think our other volunteers are going to write some other books, but anyway, they're not going to do it by tomorrow. Um, but uh, he's going to be our speaker on leadership. It's a little different than what we've done, but he's a Marine Corps, uh, 13 years, Naval Academy, so I think he will teach us a lot about uh, leadership. Uh, I've also learned a lot already. On October 14th and 15th, we have not done a lot for the Vietnam era, but we're going to have a reenactment here. We're going to have a Huey helicopter that's flying in from Columbus, Indiana, that's been doing this for a long period of time. They will give you rides. you got to pay for them. We're going to go up a Huey, and it has a unique sound that everybody in Vietnam could, uh, could hear. So I'd love to have you on the 14th and 15th. Um, and then the last announcement is 11-11-11. Uh, is That's a Saturday this year. And there'll be a breakfast here. And it's free uh, for veterans and their family. Uh, so it starts at 7 in the morning. It'll be over at about 11. During that time, a lady that's written a book on a turret that uh, uh, she's gone around in Europe and uh, studied most of turrets. That's the top part of that tank that we have. She will give short lectures, like two or three or four minutes during your breakfast. At 12 o'clock, we have an expert from Oshkosh going to talk about planes. So any of you are interested in that, he'll be talking about planes. And we will probably have 100 people here listening to him. He's a mechanic, a flyboy, and everything else. Now, today's, uh, we have a, a, a table back there for membership, home room and uh, and, uh, and uh, Mrs. Kathy Renner. There's another table with the Epsilon Library, and you've been using it, but the Epsilon Library has a database they brought from Skip off from Skip's Hire, use your tax money, uh, and use also their foundation money. But uh, it's every newspaper article from about 1880 all the way to 1999. So, like I looked up, you can ask, like I looked up Bunko, and my grandmother was playing Bunko in 1936, and you know, they put anything in there then. But you can search your name, and they will show you how to search names. He's a war expert, so if you want something about war that affected Evans, so head into Evans on paper. But it's a great search tool that only about, when the library got it, it was about 10 years ago, and there were only 10 cities in the United States that had the ability to do that. Now Jasper's caught on in some other state cities in the country, but uh, they bought it for a lot of money, but it's scanned an index, so it's not easy to search. So he, that gentleman, there's a lady and gentleman back there right behind the guy in the red shirt over there. They will help you if you've got any interesting, anything you want to search, they'll search it. Walk over there, write it down, and they will search it and really give you a lot of data. So the last thing we want to do, and the most important, is a, a gentleman named, that graduated from the University of Alabama, played on our football team. Mr. Beck is here. He's an FBI retired agent, and his dad was his coach for one year. We also have Spike Bell as a teammate, and there's probably some other people in the University of Alabama. But he graduated in 69, and he was in the Indiana National Guard. And this flag over here is Indiana National Guard. It's a National Guard flag, it's not the Indiana flag, but this flag, remember we got nine flags in our country, we just got the space flag, uh, but this is the National Guard, and Mr. Bredholt talked about the flags not too long ago, but this is the National Guard, and it is very important um, in our protection of our country, because not everybody can be on active duty all the time, these guys can work and then come in when we have problems, and he'll talk about it, and it, and he's talked to me about it some, and it's very unique. I knew very little what he talked about, and I was in the military for a long time. So I think you'll all learn a lot about what our National Guard does, Indiana and nationally, and even you'll tell you about the California National Guard, where they're in that Russian skirmish right now. We were in Iraq and Iran, but he'll go over all that, and I think, uh, you know, that's pretty high ranking. It's very few people get to be general, so we're lucky to have him. So uh, this is Major. Um, Marty Embar, Embar, General, Major General, 
Spike Bell uh, is the guy that does the uh, the demonstrator here, helping people learn how to fly. He was my fraternity son back in college and a pretty good football player here for the University of Evansville. So he's been a big part, as, along with Mark, of being a part of this museum that you all should be so proud of, what you've done here collectively to show the involvement that Evansville community had to the war effort. And I was, I've got a chance to walk around for about an hour and I could, you could stay here for a couple days, as you all know. But it's very, 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 very impressive. And, uh, but, but Spike told me about this and, and he and Mark asked me and I did want, want to come down and I'm really glad to be here. And I did see my good football mate, uh, Beck, where are you there? Jim? Yeah, uh, I, I, can I tell a story about that guy? Well, first of all, his father helped recruit me to come to University of Evansville. You know about his father. He's uh, a World War II uh, Navy guy. And, uh, but let me tell you what I can tell you about uh, Jim here is uh, he played football, and I was a sophomore, and he was a senior. And he played linebacker, and I played linebacker. He was, I, I was on the bench. He, he was the guy playing. What I remember about him is that he, he had his shoulder just dislocated playing. And, uh, you know, that's pretty much ends your, ends your career, particularly for that year, if not that game for sure. I would see this guy go over to the bench, put his arm up like this and have somebody come down. I watched this and sat on the arm and, and knocked it back in and went back in and played. I saw you do that many, many times. You made many, many more tackles. And he ended up being an FBI agent. I, I, would you collectively with me give him a round of applause? For <laughs> I also see a, 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 a guardsman with me that I served with right there. You know C.T. Montgomery with his aunt from Princeton? C.T. was one of my junior officers. I think he retired as a Fulbright colonel, uh, one of my battalion commanders, a former Marine. And I, and I he used to do that hood to me all the time. But he's a damn good guardsman too. He's a great patriot and C.T. is an honor serve with you and thank you for your service and it's, and it's good to see you. Well, I, I, probably, I know there's some folks here from the college that came out. Thank you for coming. We give my best to the president and the, our wonderful university here, which I'm so proud to be a graduate of. And uh, again, well, let, me, let me get into a little bit about give you the, the, uh, the playground here for some of my comments. I'm going to be, this, this is going to be kind of a, a different speech that I've given. I, I got kind of motivated because in talking to Mark, he said, you know, I don't know much about the National Guard and, you know, we're all active duty guys and, and, and I would tell you, I've got that my entire life, right, CT? I don't know anything about the Guard. I don't know the Guard. You know. So I thought I was going to try to do my best to all of you to since I'm of age now, and uh, when you get retired, you kind of look back a little bit on your heritage, and you kind of wonder how did I get to where I was, and who really was I, and what was I doing? So I've done a little bit. I'm not a historian, and I'm not a constitutionalist or whatever, but I've tried to do my best today to relate to you the militia heritage of our Army, our Air Force and our services and our militia heritage of our nation and where the militia that ultimately became called the National Guard, where it fit into all this, particularly in the beginning 
in each and every conflict of our nation the role that the militia and the National Guard has played. So I, I want to preface it a little bit to everybody. I know I look out here, we've probably got a lot of Navy guys, we got a lot of regular Army guys, we got Coast Guard, I'm sure we got many, many Marines, the Air Force. Please, when I make my comments today, kind of bear with me because I'm going to basically talk mostly about the citizen soldier and the militia side of our nation. And I want you to understand when I'm doing this, I can, you've got to understand the appreciation and respect that I have for all our armed forces. And I felt very privileged and honored to wear the cloth of our nation like you did. So I'll give you a little preamble there. So let's go on a ride. Let's go on a ride. Let's go on a ride. I, I, what's the oldest military organization? What, what, what's the oldest one out there? Right, that, that man, I, I need to give him a, a, a coin. He missed it by one year. He, he said the National Guard, 1637. It was, six, it was December the 13th. You only missed it by a few days, 1636. In Salem, Massachusetts, 1636. What, what the heck was going on in 1636? You know, we were, we were a colony. We had, uh, back then, we were UK. The, the Britain is how we kind of learned who we were and what we were. Well, there, it was kind of in their heritage to work. In every village, in every town, every able-bodied man would kind of have their weapon and be able to secure and defend their community, their little hamlet. But but this particular area was had under a lot of duress, so the decision was made, and the order came from the court for the Massachusetts Bay Colony that we will create three companies: one of infantry, one of artillery, and one of engineer. And we're, and we're going to ask you to drill more often, to uh, assemble more often, and heighten your level of preparedness. And if you will, if you follow me through, that's kind of the first minute man, if you will. In other words, have that weapon ready. Have that ready to let go of your plow. Whatever you're doing, take the weapon and go out and secure this community. That was 1636, December 13th. I will tell you the Department of the Army and, and the Department of Defense has recognized this, and every year that is where we have our birthday. So, but that's really not the day I think most of us think about the, the birth of, of the militia. If you go with me a little bit, let's go over 100 years on down the road, April 19, 1775. In Boston, the governor, Governor Cage, was getting a little upset with the rebellion from the colonists that was going on. So he basically rallied about a thousand of English troops and said, I want you to march about 20 miles into this place called Lexington, and I want you to go get a couple of these rebel leaders by the name of John Hancock and John Adams. They're holed up there, and, the, and these colonists have got ammunition and they got weapons stored in Lexington, and I want you to go get them. So off those thousand soldiers went, they marched, they went to the village green in Lexington. But the night before, some of our spies, our colonist spies, had heard this. And one of these guys that heard this was a guy by the name of Paul Revere. I mean, you've maybe heard his name. So he and a guy by the name of Pickering, they took off and they drove through the countryside. Now, it is proven if you do the history, I wish we could say, he said the British are coming, the British are coming. I think in documents they, he didn't base, he said that. But he basically alarmed the countrymen that bad things are happening and the British are on the way. And everybody was kind of on alert. But when they got into Lexington, there was about 60 or 70 of our fellow countrymen there. There no countrymen because we didn't have a country then. It was just colonists that were there don't know who fired the first shot, but seven of our fellow um, patriots, thank you, were killed. One was mortally wounded, and the word went out. They went on a little uh, further down the road meeting the English, and they went into the bridge at Concord. By that time, that 60 or 70 grew to about a couple hundreds. And that's when it happened to where they lost three 
soldiers, and they looked around, and their company commander said, we got to get the heck out of here because things isn't, isn't right. There's 19 miles back to Boston, and let me tell you, that six or, 60 or 70 turned into about 2,000. 2,000 of our patriots left their home, left their plow, grabbed their musket, and if you'll permit me, there was a poem written about this event. Emerson later wrote, by the rude bridge that arched the flood, their flag to April's breeze unfurled. Here once the embattled farmer stood and fired the shot heard round the world. Emerson wrote that about 100 years later when he was talking at the memorial at Concord where they were dedicating a statue to that event. I went on to research a little bit. Rude, what is, what is rude bridge? What, what's a rude bridge? Rude basically means that it was simply built. It was a bridge not very complicated in construction. The flood means it was in April. Uh, rains. There, there was high water going on. The embattled. What was the embattled farmer in? It was basically representing a man of a tough, difficult life and existence, and one that Emerson felt, no doubt, had seen action before. So those 700 soldiers, I say, the, the, the battle was on, the shark heard round the world, the beginning of the Revolutionary War, April 19, 1775. You think about this, we didn't have an army, we didn't have a navy, we didn't have anything. We had 13 separate colonies trying to find the biggest, most feared military, both naval and land forces in the world. But if we back up just a little bit, if you'll permit me, let's, let's go back a few years to 1774 to 1762. Let me tell you what was going on. A thing called the Seven Years' War, we know it as the French-Indian War, where the British was fighting the French and the Indian for possessions along our area. And, and, and who was on the British side then? We were. And who was one of our best commanders that fought with the British during those years? A lieutenant colonel from Washington that was highly regarded as Washington, from Virginia, but a name Lieutenant Colonel George Washington fought on, with the British to fight the Indians and the French for, for a position. And so there he learned a lot about battle. He learned about the insurgency. He learned about how the Indians fought and against a bigger force. He was almost killed twice. He was almost captured at Fort N N N Necessity. He had a lot of laws he had to utter. But anyway, he served those six or seven years during the French and Indian War. So, but, and one other thing that happened, King George, the, the king of England during that, thought, said, I've got to win that. I'm, so if we got the colonists by our side, I'm gonna send forces over. That's how the army got over there, 17, they, they came over to fight the Indian, French and Indian War with an agreement to us, the colonists, that if you fight with us and we win, we'll go back home. Well, he reneged on that promise. He left their forces here. They even lived in a lot of our homes. And they were forced to live in our homes. And we did not like it. The other thing the king began to do, because he had to pay for that war, he began taxing us and in bargaining and do all this and that's what prompted us to kind of say enough's enough and that's when that when he made that he made that walk so that kind of gives you background the boston tea party was done before that just a few months before that and that really upset the king that upset the local governor so he was kind of doing a lot of things so that prompted that day. So, how does 13 separate colonies fight the largest military there is in, in the world? And it's April 19. Well, the Continental Congress got together and on June the 14th of 1775, they created the United States Army. It's also Flag Day. That's our, that's my birthday, the Army, June the 14th, 1775. Well, they figured out pretty soon the English are moving their troops around and they're moving their goods around all the rivers around there. No way we're gonna fight that. So October the 13th, 1775, 
they established the United States Navy. So you need the Navy guys, that's your birthday, October 13, 1775. How are you going to protect the, how are you going to protect those boats when they're roaming around and they, 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 they get up close to shore and they might jump in there? How are they going to protect them? November the 10th. You know, I know every Marine knows that knows that. Any, how many Marines you got here? I guarantee you, I know you know November the 10th. Because it gets beat into you when you're going to your training. But our 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 Congress we didn't have a Congress. Then the, the Continental Congress, we didn't have a country yet established the Marine Corps initially to provide protection for the Navy, but we all know that's grown to many, many, one of the best land forces there has been in the world, United States Marine birthday, 10 November, 1775. August the 4th, 1790, what's that going to do? Well, we were not, we were trying to get, the time that we've been a company then, 1790, but we were trying to get the tariffs and all the fees coming to us on goods going around the rivers and, and, that, and we weren't getting it so we created the United States Coast Guard. That's the Coast Guard originally was out there just trying to make sure we got the funds and the money that we deserve and now we know that the Coast Guard does a lot of search and rescue and everything else but the, but the Coast Guard's birthday is 1790. How many knows this one? September the 18th, 1947. What do you think that is? That's right. When you air guys that were Army Air Corps, how many Army Air Corps guys we got here? I'm sure I know. I, I know that plane was an Army plane, Army Air Corps plane. But it's but Billy Mitchell, General Billy Mitchell, in 1945 after the war, said we need our own service. We're, we provide that much need. We've got to be able to control ourselves. They broke away from the Army. The United States Air Force was established September 18, 1947. Now we have one more service, a new, a new service, which is just established. I don't know much about it. It's got a lot to do with cyber. All that thing is going on, but it's December the 20th, 2019, Space Force. How, how, how are we going to fight, how are we going to fight China in, in, up in the air without having somebody focused on it every day? So that, I, I can't tell you much about it, but those are the services that we have and those are birthday, but that's let, let's let's go back. Now we got an army, now we got all this 1776, and we, and we come along here. So we fight the Revolutionary War, and we end up at Yorktown, April 19, 1781. York, why, why did we jump forward that much? We don't want to talk about every, every battle, but Cornwallis, I do want to tell you this Cornwallis had been down in South Carolina with his army, and he's been fighting. One of the militiamen down there by the name of Francis Marion, you ought to Google Francis, General Francis Marion from South Carolina. He had all the militia in South Carolina fighting Cornwallis in the swamps of South Carolina. And they were just doing pretty well, so Cornwallis said, we gotta get the heck out of here. So he comes up and he gets up there and Washington sees him marching. Washington assigns right at Yorktown. The French Navy blocks the river, so the Navy of the United Kingdom, England cannot come in to get their forces off. They're sitting there, Cornwallis is he's tired, his army's almost depleted, he has nowhere to go. And we did two final assaults, and Washington choose two commanders to lead that final assault. I've been to Yorktown, I know this for an absolute fact. One of them, who, who was our greatest ally during the Revolutionary War? The French. I hope you, there are a lot of times we get upset with the French, but if you study this, we would have never won that war without the French, because he, you think about this. So his good friend, Lafayette, I want to be lead my Frenchman in the final assault. And Washington had a great able-bodied assistant all during the time, and he, this able-bodied assistant was very talented and, and, a, and a good officer, and he wanted to go to the sport, he wanted to go out to the field, and, and Washington wouldn't let him. No, you're staying with me. You're staying with me. You're staying with me. Finally, on this last day, you have the other abutment, the other rampart that you can attack on this final assault. So he picked Alexander Hamilton, Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Hamilton. And this, the plaques are out there at York, Yorktown. They went up and the, and the white flag went out. The Revolutionary War, in effect, was over. In, and the uh, Treaty of 
of the Paris. It, it happened in 1980, excuse me, 1781, but 1783, so I finally signed the treaty in Paris between England and us. I got somehow a region six days before we were going to the treaty. War, you got to remember the war is over. Washington was asked by a committee from the Continental Congress, General, what do we need as a young nation? What do we need to protect ourselves? What, what would be the most important thing, the three or four things you think we need to do as we're getting ready to become our own country? And you re get, realize this, let's go back in time, we were broke. I mean, we, we didn't have any money. We had this country. Uh, it was it was it was not an easy it was not an easy time. And I, and, and, and I hope I can find the four things that, that he said. If you'll permit me here a moment, I got I got I got too many notes, but I found them. See, see, generals needs aids. You know, you you got an aid, he's going to get give you a lot of stuff. I even wrote this down. You know, I said six days before the treaty, a committee headed by Alexander Hamilton enlisted General Washington wanted to know what he felt was needed to secure and defend our new nation. General Washington con consulted with his generals, Generals Von Steuben, General Knox, General Pickering, General Harrington, and General Lafayette. And here's what he said. Here's the four things he said that we need to focus on to have a nation. We should maintain a small standing army active with key posts and armories throughout the nation. Reliance on the number two, reliance on the militia, and all should be and the militia should be trained to at least a minimum standard. Now here we he's talking about government. Washington was not big on government. He was not big on a big standing army. Let's let's have a decent army but we have to have the militia to run. A subset of that militia should be a more highly trained and ready to respond while the other militia is being trained up in a time of need. The Minuteman concept, kind of like I told Earl earlier, one's a little more highly trained, more ready as we get ready to go. And the fourth thing, he said, established military institutions for study. Think West Point. Those are the four things that Washington gave to said we need to do. The treaty was signed, and he was elected president in 1789, and was our president for eight years. I don't even know this or not, but everybody wanted him to stay on. Everybody wanted him to stay on. Everybody who would not want George Washington. You know, George Washington is about six foot three. He's a farmer. He's kind of a good-looking guy. You know, if, if you read all about this, he, he was one hell of a leader. And he led a country through some of the most perilous times, and people hung in there because of the respect and admiration they had for him as a person. So we got to know he is a father of our country. He deserves it. Not because he was our first president. He deserves it. But he looked at all of them and he says, no. The worst thing we can have, he said, we just came out of a tyrant. We just came out of someone that says, we're going to rule you. No, no one person is that important. That our nation should survive, so he turned it down. If you look back on it, it's it's kind of amazing. So we go forward here, that's 1789 to 1797. The next thing I want to talk to you about, about the about the militia, is a little something that happened. Now, let me tell you what's going on here with the United States. We didn't have a country yet. I mean we we've got a country, I'm sorry. 1776. We've got in our independence. The, the, the Constitution was passed in 1787, so we had our Constitution. There were some amendments to the Constitution. One was the Second Amendment. I'm going to talk about it in, in, a, in, in a minute, because I think you know about the Second Amendment. There's probably a sentence in that Second Amendment you don't, you don't realize. But let's, let's go back to a little something that happened in 1811. There was the wars with the Indians. We, we were trying to move everything west. We had a very, very popular uh, territory governor here in Indiana by the name of William Henry Harrison. You do your homework. Well, he was out of Vincennes, so he was held up, but he kind of got to Jefferson and had kind of told him, you kind of keep moving out there. He's, uh, he, we didn't have a state yet. We weren't a, Indiana wasn't a state, we were a territory, but Tecumseh, the Shawnee Indian, 
was rallying the other tribes and said, enough's enough, and we're, we're not going any further. This is where it's going to end. We're done moving. He's out there doing this, so William Henry Harrison with 200 regulars and 750 militiamen. Okay? Militiamen. What I talk about, our heritage. Took the march all the way up to Lafayette. Battleground is the name of it. And that's where he thought Tecumseh was at. Tecumseh wasn't there. Tecumseh left. His brother, the prophet, was there with about 1,500 Indians. And on the 7th of November, 1811, the Indians attacked and called the Battle of Tippecanoe. William Henry Harrison. William Henry Harrison. It was a heck of a battle. I mean, we lost 63. They had over 150 killed. But, but we were victorious. Now, I want to tell you about some of the militiamen that fought. Of that 63, um, uh, there are eight of them that were very heroic, and eight of our set 92 counties are named after them. Uh, of course, Harrison County, that, you know, William Henry Harrison is named ap after him. Colonel Andrew Owen. Owen, Owen County, was killed in action. A colonel. Colonel John Tippett. This is the East Raider. Owens was a militiaman. He was actually part of the state uh, initial territory assembly. John Tippett was an a aide to uh, the general killed in action. Tippett County. Major Joseph Davies. The, he, he mounted a counterattack and was one of the first ones to kill him. Very heroic. Davies County. This ought to hit you pretty good. A company commander killed in action the name of Captain Jacob Warwick. Pretty close, huh? Boonville killed in action. Company commander right out with his troops. The next, uh, the next one was a uh, called the, Ye the, the Yellow Jackets. He was part of the counterattack. Captain Spear Spencer. Company commander killed the first night. Two survived, they were wounded, but they did very heroic actions. One of them ultimately was a captain, became a major general in the Indiana militia by the name of Joseph Bartholomew Columbus. And the final one was a French, French Canadian that was very good friends with William Henry Harrison, and they fought in prayer time during that six years' war by the name of Townsend Dubois, a Frenchman, very hard. He did survive. There's eight counties from that day in 1811 that are state named after them. But my point is they were all militiamen. They were citizen soldiers, left their homes, went with the general, fought to try to get our freedom. 1811. 1812, you know, the, you know, the British, they saw we didn't have any money. We've been, we're having trouble. We've been fighting the Indians. Okay, the British says, we're going we're to take this place back again. War of 1812. 1814, in, in our capital, this is when our militiamen didn't do so well. Some of our local militias have rallied because the British said they're going to burn the White House. And they did. Some of our guys ran. And they burned them. And they took over our capital in 1814. But a few weeks later, some militiamen in the harbor in Baltimore, where the British had said, we're going to take down your flag, we're going to blow it to smithereens, Fort McHenry. But the militia rallied, and they stood on those ramparts, and the rockets red glare, the bombs glistening in air through the night. We survived. Our flags are by Francis Scott Key, watching all this, wrote our national anthem that night, watching what went on, and we held, and that flag held, and the British loaded up in 1814 and moved, and moved on out. You know, we're the only country that our national anthem is about our flag.
the next year, 1850, the British said, we're going we're to end this thing. We're going to go to the center of your nation, and we're going to take over your port, and we're going to go down there, and we're going to shut down all your, all your commerce. And they went in at this, with the biggest force they ever had in 1815. They went into New Orleans, but they ran into a guy by the name of Jackson, who had three militiamen of states, the Kentucky, the Tennessee, and the Louisiana militia stood by him, and they whipped their ass. We whipped them right there, and let me tell you, that was the end of the War of 1812. Oh, Hickory stood, and it ended it. The British went home. But again, I'm telling you, it, I'm so proud of the, Benish, of, of the heritage. Okay, 1815, they're gone. We've got a country. We're going along. Things are kind of working. We're moving out west. You know, this, in 1860, you know what happened in 1861. But you know, in 1860, you know the size of our army in 1860? It was, we had all the Congress authorized 16,000 positions. That was the size of our army. Less than 10,000 were actually assigned. And they were mostly out west as we were trying to move west. We had from our forts listening to what Washington had said. We had people stationed, but we had no military. But in 1861, you know, we had the south, north, south. We're not going to get into that. You know, I'm, this is Evansville, a little further south of what I am, but we're still, we're, we're still in the north, right? But I, I say this because I've served all over, and let me tell you, the guys from the south, they, they, ain't, gave this, they ain't gave this thing up yet. Whoa! <laughs> They're still fighting that Civil War. And uh, I will tell you a couple, CT will tell you, I got it in one of my training, I got one of this, as I was a lieutenant, we're down there, and this, we'd had a few beers, you know, the afterwards in a social event, and this guy from, Texas down there, you black, you damn Yankees, you know, and he said, if it hadn't been for that, that attack, you know, that attack in, in Gettysburg, you know, we would stick, I said, hey, look, man, we whipped your ass once, we can do it again. <laughs> it was on, it was on, and we all got in trouble. <laughs> but, but it made me learn how sensitive we still are in our country. But 1861, you know what happened, the North and South, and you think about this, I just told you, we had less than 10,000 Armed. So what, what was the Civil War fought by? Citizen soldiers on both sides. You, you had some officers on both sides, but, but the guys and gals that are out there fighting are just let go of the plow. They were going for their country. They're going for their community in that terrible war for four years. I want to I wanna highlight, and, and you need, somebody need to tell me if, if, if I'm too long. Because I, I, I love this heritage and, and I can shut it off in time. You're fine. Keep going. Okay. All right. Mark. Dr. Mark. I'll, I'll keep going. But, but there, there, there are two militiamen I like to talk bring of all of these that maybe you've heard of, maybe you haven't. One of them was in Greek Castle, Indiana. And back when we, uh, if you know this or not, Indiana volunteered more per capita for the North on all eight of the 15 states that fought in the North except for Delaware. Our Governor Morton was very close to Abraham Lincoln, so he really pushed to get a lot of Hoosiers to volunteer. And you had this situation where you could, if you had it, you could create your own regiment and go out and recruit for it. Well, there was this captain that was from Greencastle, Indiana, the home of DePaul, that had a little bit of money, and he was an artilleryman, all you artillery guys. So he goes out, he buys his cannons, and he creates his company, and he goes into his regiment, and he ends up at Chickamauga, and, uh, and fought, and fought bravely, very heroic, and he was Eli Lilly. And you know all about Greencastle, DePaul has a lot of his heritage. I hope you know how much the Lilly family has done for our nation. Or not for our nation, for our state. Uh, I, I will tell you, I was fortunate to be the adjutant general for 11 years, and we had some soldiers and their families that had some economic difficulties. An example would be, I'm getting off script, but I'm going to tell you this, an example would be one of our soldiers uh, calls home and takes his, uh, he's having an affair, man, okay? And he's got a wife and two kids at home, but he calls home and he changes his checking account, and puts in a different account, so, that, so the lady's sitting there, She's got two kids, and she's got no way to pay the bills, and she's a, so the work comes to me. I don't know what we're gonna do. So I get my staff in, I get my lawyers, sir, there's nothing you can, I mean, you can't take, you can't take appropriated money and pay for them. You know, you, you can't. 
I said, this is ridiculous. We gotta, we gotta go out here and get some money. I went to Lily. Lily gave me, every year I was at the general, $500,000 into an account that we could use for things like this. I'm using that as an example. We had one family that a hurricane came through. They lost, they lost their house. They lost, he didn't have any money. They didn't know where to go. They had kids. We put them up, we found them a trailer. We got them going. But Lily in down there. And, uh, the, the, let's, let's do thank them for that. Thank you. I know that's what I'm going to do. I went over one day, I was going to give him a replica of a Minute Man. I called him, I'm going to go to the Lily down, and I'm going to present you a Minute Man. And I told him I was going <coughs> So I get a call back from the executive director of the Lilly Endowment. General, this is so so I said, yes, sir. He says, I understand you're coming over today. I said, yes. He says, do not come. I said, okay. He said, we do not accept anything. We give. We don't accept anything. Please don't be offended. We're here for you. Is that not philanthropic as best? And, and, and they, they'd be upset right now if I was, if I was telling you this. But, but anyway, okay, that's Eli Lilly. Tommy knows a lot about Gettysburg, the three-day battle in Gettysburg, okay? The same thing, there was this regiment out of Maine that was created, a thousand men infantry, and the number two guy in it was a college professor. He was a lieutenant colonel. And he decided to leave because he wanted to serve. He wanted to do his part, so he joined the regiment. They went out, and that thousand men over a period of battles came down to 250. It's sick. Not all were killed, but they were, some were injured. He got put on the, the all in line on day two of Gettysburg. It was, he was the final, if you, if you take this whole line, and he got told, and, he, and then he was the colonel. His, his colonel had left. You're in charge, you cannot, you cannot give up the line. You can't let the Confederates roll up that line because if they do, they're going to take this. This is day two, July 3rd, 1863. He stood there, attack after attack after attack. The 200 men went down to 100 men, went down to 50 men. And he's standing there with them. And his brother was in the unit with him, came to him and said, Colonel, we're out of ammunition. And so he looks around there and said, we have to retreat. We have to retreat. He looked around and he goes, we shall not retreat. We have to hold this line. Fix bayonets. Fix bayonets. We're going down the hill. He charged down that hill, July the 3rd, 1863. The Alabama and the Tennessee soldiers were sort of taken back by it. They thought it was a frontal assault and they surrendered. Joshua Chamberlain, please remember that name. Google it. I'm, I'm telling you, he ended up uh, became a general. He was shot at Petersburg. They thought he was going to die. He they took him back to Vermont. He recovered. He came back. He became a legend with Grant. And at Appomattox, when uh, Lee said, "I do not want to be on the field when we actually uh, turn the flags," but he done it. So Grant said, Grant gave him the, was nice. You don't have to be out there. But his general was General Johnson, rode up in his horse. And, and, and Grant picked Johnson Chamberlain, being a citizen soldier, to represent us. To stand there and accept the surrender. With the guidance, you will not show them any respect. They started this thing. They started it. We've ended it. When they come up and they throw their rifles down, he's a, a higher rank than you are. But, so Joshua Stane is standing there being a citizen soldier, and this General Johnson came up on his steed with his head down, threw his rifle down, and Joshua, Joshua Chamberlain rendered the hand salute to him. The beginning of the reconciliation in the North and the South. I mean, with a regular, I mean, that's what citizen soldiers do. To, to try to bring our country back. So that's why I'm a Joshua Chamberlain fan. And if you're movie buffs, the best movie, there, there's a book written on it by Shara. It's called Killer Angels. But go get the movie Gettysburg. It's a long movie. But Jeff Daniels, if you know that actor, plays Joshua Chamberlain. And 
they have actually, uh, historians have said it's the most authentic replica of that big three-day battle that any of them got. I, re I recommend you do it. They're, they're two heroes of mine. So that's that's the Civil War. I think you know the Spanish-American War next. Yeah, a guy from New York, a guardsman that was pretty popular, comes down there and rides up that hill. You know, Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt was a New York guardsman. And when he went down there, he, he, he became a colonel and he rode up San, San Juan Hill. But let me tell you what happened during the Spanish-American War. You remember, I talk about the good and the bad. They mobilized the militia. You've got to remember, Congress did not give any money. It's up to the states. Because the states is control. The commanding general of the Indiana National Guard is the governor. It's not the president. And the, and the governor has his adjutant, adjutant general, to lead it. But in a time of war, the president asks when you're forced and you federalize them, they, the commander-in-chief of C.T. Montgomery, when he went off to war, which he did, was the president of the United States. And when he comes back home, he comes back to me, comes back to the governor. Isn't that great? Isn't that a great, great situation? It, I, it, I, I can actually read it. I won't go into it, maybe at time, but it's actually here in our, in our Constitution. War Powers Act provide forth and calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions. Congress will provide for the organizing, arming, and discipline of the militia, reserving to the states, respectively, the appointment and the authority of the training. It's a great thing. It, it works well. So, but why I'm telling you that is in 1898, when we did the Spanish-American War, a bunch of states showed up, did a good job, some of them didn't do so well. So in 1903, Congress got together and they wrote the, the Militia Act of 1903, said, we're going to fund you. We're, and we're not going to call you the militia anymore, you're called the National Guard. And that was the creation of our name. We got funded, and that's 1903. Well, what happened in 1917 to 1919? World War One. In Indiana, we, we got created a division, an infantry division. There's 18 divisions in the United States Army today. Divisions will be the 101st Airborne Division, 82nd Division, 1st Infantry Division. Well, the National Guard's got eight. And their number's 26 through 50. The, 20, the first 25 divisions made by our Congress for active duty, 26 through 50 for National Guard. We're number 38. And any of you out here wore the 38 patch, 38, you know, you know, you know what I'm talking about. But in 1917, the 38 division was mobilized. He got sent down to Shelby, Mississippi. In 1917, uh, and they're all down there, a bunch of Indiana soldiers, and and, and, and they're down there, and the hurricane hit and knocked, knocked all their tents down. Of course, being from Indiana, they go, oh my God, we got hit by a tornado. We got hit by a cyclone last night. They didn't know what a hurricane was, so they nicknamed the 38th Division the Cyclone Division. And that's what the patch that we wear in 1917. When they got sent over to Europe, but guess what the Army did? They basically said, okay, you're not going to fight as a division. We're going to, this squad's going here, this platoon's going here, this company's going here, this battery's going here. They split them all up. So when they come back home, we're very victorious. In World War I, we came over, uh, you know, you know, you know, you know. We came over and it changed it. We won that, and but but the army wanted to say, let's get rid of the guard, get everything regular, and they tried to do that. Congress said no. In 1933, they validated it. So again, the militia heritage stayed. So that now now we go to 1941. Does anybody remember that one? <laughs> it, it, do we have any World War II at all? I know we got a lot of you. But thank you for your service, sir. God bless you. Thank you. The greatest generation right there. Am I all right? <laughs> well, everybody, there was a 16 million Americans served in World War II. Uh, Indiana's division, 38th division, went, trained, back down to Camp Shelby, and they got sent to the Philippines. And their job was to retake Baton. Baton Death March. MacArthur said, I shall return. 
let me tell you, in my office as adjutant general, I've got, I got the picture of the surrender of the Japanese general to the 38th Division general in Bataan. And guess who showed up a couple days later? Douglas MacArthur. And Douglas MacArthur looked out over the 38th Division. He says, I just renamed you Avengers of Bataan. That's our name. We're the Cyclone Division, because we got hit by a hurricane. We went over and avenged all those that were killed during the Patan Death March. And the man, Douglas MacArthur, gave us that name. And it's our nickname today, the 38th Infantry Division. And I'll tell you, the 38th Infantry Division has been all over the world since. It's been in Iraq, it's been in Afghanistan. It just got back. Uh, you, you, I hope you're very proud of not only what you got here, but the military heritage. A couple of guys I would like to single out from World War II, one of them is a unit. Um, my mind a little, a little bit blank here. It was uh, 6th, June, June the 6th, 1944. Ring a bell to anybody. D-Day. I hope nobody, nobody really understands this, but you know what the lead division, the lead division of the four divisions that hit the beaches in Normandy was the Virginia National Guard. The 29th Infantry Division with the 116th Infantry and the lead element. Did if any of you watch Saving Private, Private Ryan? You ever seen that movie? Do you see when the first ones go down and the first boats have losses? And again, you guys, I want you guys to Google this and tell me. The, the first two, three lead boats was from Cal Company A, the 116th Regiment of the 29th Division of the Virginia National Guard. They were from Bedford, Virginia. When 30 of the guys graduated from high school, 30 of them went down and joined their National Guard unit. That meant after 1940 when they joined it, 30 of them. 19 of those 30 was on that, were on that boat were killed then. The most killed in, by one town ever. The monument is in Bedford, Virginia, but Omaha Beach was led by the Virginia National Guard. Now right next to them was the 1st Infantry Division. On down the line was the 4th Infantry Division, went to Utah. They didn't have anything. Of course, you've heard of the Rangers, I'm sure, that climbed the hill at Point Bahai, and they did a wonderful job. But, but again, we don't get this often. I, I, I have been to Omaha Beach. I was there on the 60th anniversary. I was there when there was eight survivors of that attack from the 29th, and they dedicated a uh, statue to them at that, at that time. And it was very moving for me to be there at 6.30 in the morning. It was the same time those first boats went, went down and let these guys tell about it. I mean, most of them, they, they don't even know why they're even here today. And they carry a lot of guilt with them that they are here today because their buddy next to them and everybody else didn't make it. But that's that's the Bedford boys. That's the Venture of Bataan in, in World War II. Now, Vietnam. I hope you all know about the most decorated company in all of Vietnam. The company size on it, it's all it's all documented. Uh, one platoon is right is from right here in Evans, Evansville, Company D Rangers. And I do know these guys. I've met them many, many times. Is Larry Rhodes? Larry Rhodes here at all? You got anybody know Larry Rhodes? Everything. Just, just, just let me, this this comes out of the historical of, of the United States Army. The most decorated company size unit in all the Vietnam War. 974 patrols, over 250 killed in action, six of their own was killed in action. Here we go, 18 Silver Stars. That's the third highest thing. You don't get a Silver Star. They don't give you Silver Stars. You, you've got to earn a Silver Star. It has to be done for Valor. One Soldier's Medal, another one just for Valor. 122 Bronze Stars with 87 of those with Valor. 101 Purple Hearts. 
of those 204 soldiers, 101 of them were shot. 111 air medals, 184 army accommodation medals, and 30 of those with the V device. No other single army infantry company was decorated in any year-long tour of duty than the Indiana Rangers. You know, being an Indiana guy, when I would go to Washington, D.C., and I'd go to our, uh, we have a museum there. Let me tell you, there's a whole section on Company D Rangers. We got their uniform, just like you guys got it here. I, I, they, they probably don't talk about it. Soldiers never do, but you've got a very, very, very patriotic uh, company here with a lot of heritage. Uh, I'm getting kind of down to the end here. Uh, Mark wanted me to talk about this Ukraine and California National Guard. The best way I can explain this to you is uh, 1989, you know what happened then when Reagan, you know what I heard Reagan when he said, Gorbachev, tear this wall down. Gorbachev, tear this wall down. He meant tear down the wall. Tear down the wall that they built, you know, after World War II. The Russians lost many more than we did in World War II. And they, they wanted all those territories. They got, you know, Poland, all the Baltics, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, Hungary, Estonia, Lat Latvia, all those became part of the Soviet Union. And all that thing came down in 1989. And in 1992, the Department of Defense said, we got to do something. We got to figure out all these countries are sitting out there. We need to become partner with them. Let's, why don't we take, how are we going to get generals inside there and try to help them? A guy by the name of John Conaway. Do you know that name? John Conaway? From Evansville, University of Evansville, he was the chief of the National Guard Bureau. He says, I'll take states. I'll take a state. You give a country a state, I can assign that National Guard, we can have a relationship. It was kind of like a sister city town. Well, we got Slovakia. Because how did we get Slovakia? Because in 1992, Czechoslovakia split peacefully. Czech Republic to the west and the Slovak Republic to the east. Slovak Republic butts right into the Ukraine. So we got Slovakia. Uh, Illinois got Poland. Polacks, doesn't that make, doesn't make sense? <laughs> so anyway, we've had this relationship and California got the Ukraine. The California National Guard has been training Ukrainians for years. Nobody didn't realize that we really helped their level of readiness. And that's, that's why right off the bat, the, the Russians were, they, they couldn't take them on. And you got a country five times the size. But this, this relationship has been going on for decades. It's a wonderful relationship. And is, is Mark, Mark giving me the, uh, okay, I, 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 I tell you a quick story about, I, I was a brand new Adjutant General 2004, I, I get the call from Washington and says, we just got word that Slovakia is going to be admitted into NATO. We're going to have, going to have a big ceremony in, in, in the square. we got to go. Yes, sir. So we get to, I take off and we go. <laughs> oh, my God, this downtown. They got, they got all this thing set up. They got this beautiful theater. They're having a reception. And, you know, I had my uniform on. And you go there, here's all these generals from every NATO country. And there's the prime minister, and there's the president of the country, there's the chief of defense, all these people going around with this. So on our way out to go back out there, they built this pyramid at the bottom, with, and every step was a country, and all the way up to the top was the, 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 the ex secretary general of NATO, the prime minister, the president, the chief of defense, all these different dignitaries all the way down. So anyway, on my way out, I saw another general that I knew, and I started talking to him, because I'd seen him a couple of times in other places, we got behind, so the next thing I know, we're out there and all these things are full, so I'm like right down there on the bottom, I kind of said, and there, well, I, you know, I, I can watch this thing right here. There's, I'm kind of sitting there, they, all of a sudden this slow lock soldier comes up right in front of me. Vroom, follow me, sir. He takes me down, and we go, up, 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 I don't know. and everybody's looking at me like, what are you doing? He takes me all the way up there, puts me right next to their chief of defense. And I'm sitting there and I'm looking at him, you know, what? And here's what he said. He said, 
I wanted my American general next to me. Think of what I just said. I want my American general next to me. He was so proud. You gotta remember, he's been part of the Soviet Union all these years. He's trained for the Soviet Union. But they never liked him. They didn't like him in World War I. They didn't like him in World War II. They didn't like the way they were treated. They were so proud to be an American, be allied with us. You notice he didn't say, I want party partner there. I want my American general next to me to show the world that we're allies, that we're, that we're partners. And I got one other, and then we'll go into, we'll go into any questions that you got. I have one more final thing about what the rest of the world thinks in the United States military. Let's fast forward a couple of years when the 38th Division was the final command and control for Bosnia, Kosovo, prior to taking it away from NATO and giving it to the European Union to do the peacekeeping. Well, if you, we went in there because two years earlier, Serbia, during Yugoslavia, went into civil war. Czechoslovakia split peacefully. Yugoslavia, you know, you've heard of Kosovo, Bosnia, Albania, Croatia, they all were fighting one another, particularly Serbia. Serbia was very aggressive, did a lot of terrible things. We actually went in for a short period of time and helped bomb Serbian forces that were coming in and doing atrocities in Bosnia. We were to the peacekeepers. We were trying to keep them all separate. Trying to, the whole division was over. They were split out everywhere. Well, I went over there to visit them, and I'm going there. So they said, we're going to go down there. We want to take you to this site where this huge tragedy happened, where there was 8,000 Bosnians killed by Serbians inside a battery factory. They got put in there, I think there was, there was King's X, and the uh, unit that was in charge protecting them left. And they went in there with knives, guns, clubs. And, and, and they're all buried out there. It's, it, it's a terrible thing. It's called Sevenitsa. So we go down and we go walk around this graveside. We see it and it's just very emotional. So the interpreter comes up and said, the local mayor wants to know, if there was maybe 30 or 40 of us in this group, would you be willing to come by and, and have something to eat in, in their square? And I said, well, sure. Yeah, well, look at, I mean, gosh, it's honored that they would do that. So, okay, they made changes. So we go down, we go in this beautiful little town, village, and they've got their little young dancing, and they got all laid out, and they got food, and they got a little play and some of the things, and this interpreter's there, we're trying to talk about it. I think it's a very thing. So we get done so that the mayor came down sitting next to me. He could not English. And we started talking, and I said, and I made a comment to the interpreter. I said, I said, ask the mayor, did any of his family, were they part of that terrible atrocity that we just saw? Did you lose anybody in your family? You know, I just figured a small community like that. And I mean, all of a sudden, she went blank. And I thought, what did I say wrong? And I thought, so then she started interpreting to him, and he turned red. So we're sitting there, and they're talking back and forth, and blah, 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 and I don't know what's going on, thinking, what the heck? So she comes back to me, and she goes, sir, we're in a serve town. I go, what in the world are we in the Serbs? We just went to where the Serbs just did all these atrocities from the Bosnians and we're here at the Serbs. What in the world are we doing here? I thought, man, I'm, I'm, I got ourselves in a hell of a lot of trouble. So then I sat there and, and he, he goes, no. He said, we wanted you here. I said, well, why would you want us here? We, now, we weren't fighting. The, the, the war had ended, but we were doing peacekeeping. But here, here, here's what he said. Please don't leave. Don't, United States, do not leave. You're the only country we can trust because there'll be retaliation and no one else will stand firm. You will. What an honor that is to me as an American to think we were fighting that country to try to get them to stop what they were doing. And here he is begging us not to leave because he trusted that we would take care of him like we took care of the Bosnians because that's what we do as Americans. We do the right thing. And no matter what you say in my travels, I'm, I, I can't tell you how much pride the rest of this world, I don't care what the politicians say, I, I don't care less, because they play the games with that. But the rest of this world respects the uniform that you wore and the flag that we carry more than anything in the world. God bless you all.
Testing one, three. Okay, uh, it's time for question and answers. Uh, Bruce got the camera over there. So uh, you think about a couple questions uh, and somehow I'll carry a microphone. We've got one here and one here. So uh, we move the microphone back to those two. Why? I'll ask a question or a couple of statements before we get Jack Hunter to ask a question. Uh, thank you very much, General. But you brought a couple things up. See, Larry Rhodes gave us a talk about a year ago when we have two Vietnamese cabins over there, a guy named Mike Cates and uh, Larry, C. Larry Roberts. They had a reunion here, had 30 of their guys here, and it was very emotional. What he just said, they were one of the most, the most decorated group in Vietnam. And we have two of their cabinets of memorabilia back there. So uh, I just think that's a, just a tremendous statement about our local unit here. And you look at our local unit here, it's on, uh, it's on Lloyd and, and and uh, whatever, Villa, no, Lloyd and uh, Van. And it's named John Conway. And John Conway probably was uh, was your boss at one time or Yes, he was. And his sister had Carolyn's. So your women might have bought a dress at Carolyn's. They both, uh, Carolyn's shop was right about Lincoln Avenue and Villa. And, uh, but he was very big in the National Guard in the 90s. He's written several books. And he helped support uh, Jack Butler at Suffer with him in 19 or 2014 helped support this museum. But that's uh, Conway's name, also a museum's named after him in Lexington. He's a tremendous person in, uh, and a nice guy, still living in Maryland. So those two things are important, what he said, along with everything else. I took history in grade school. I still didn't know anything he said, but now I'm starting to put it together. But uh, I could, can't Google. believe Google. Well, I don't care. You put it together in a, a very nice way, and uh, I might be able to pass my history class now. Okay, Jack. Wonderful history lesson. Thank you very, very much. You stole my thunder, because I was going to mention Lieutenant General Conway. Did you know, sir, that he was a trustee of the University of Edmonton at one point? I most certainly do. He's also a fraternity brother. Oh, shut up. <laughs> hey, I know Joe Conway very, very well, and he is everything that you've heard about. He's a wonderful man. Yes, I, I just got to say something because I want to reiterate what Jack said. I'm a younger generation, and I'll have to tell you that's the best history lesson I've ever heard about my family. Yeah. of the fact that disparaging remark made by a Texan. Well, my answer to that, sir, and there's an answer, I heard this many times before. Had there been a back door at the Alamo, we wouldn't even have a Texan Sunday. <laughs> I, I, speaking of that, I, I got a real quick one. I, I, give me a moment, I'll, I'll get you. Katrina, remember, remember Katrina? Well, uh, Jim, it wasn't General Conway, it was the guy that took his place called, want to know if I could send our Division 38 Division again, because we're out of, can you send them down to Mississippi and about 2,500 troops and help them restore law and order and do present patrols and help them? So we sent 2,500 down there. We we're all doing the problem. So, so they got down and got set up. So I, I got my helicopter and we flew down there. They were taking me out. So they took me. So we, you got to go see this one way. You got to visit this one lady in Hattie. Hattie was not on the coast, but it got hit. So we go and they take me down to this gal. It's a beautiful southern home, beautiful lawn, but it didn't rip up with all the winter and everything. So she comes out with cookies and a big pitcher of sweet tea. So she wanted to meet the Joe. She wanted to meet the Joe. So I'm sitting there, I'm, I'm meeting her. She pours me a glass of the sweet tea, and I'm drinking it. And she said, General, I want to tell you one thing. If my daddy, if my daddy was here today, he said, and I can't believe I'd be able to look at him and say, Daddy, I can't believe I'm serving sweet tea to a damn Yankee on my front yard. <laughs> but I'm damn glad you're here. <laughs> Thank you for coming. We had the greatest talk. It runs deep down here. <laughs> Earlier in the discussion, you had mentioned one sentence in the Second Amendment of the Constitution. Uh, would you please go ahead and elaborate on that? 
provide for the common defense. Which, which one was? Second Amendment. Oh, Second Amendment, yes. All right, yes. All right, I, I got it. All right, here is a what do you call it, condensed of the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment, the United States and the Constitution, a well regulated militia necessary for the security for all states, the right of the people to keep and bear arms must never be infringed. My point is the first sentence is. A well-regulated militia is necessary for the security of a free state. So in the Second Amendment, not only saying, and it cannot be infringed, what, what our forefathers said, we do not want a federal government with federal soldiers to be able to take over this nation. All our states have militias loyal to them, and that's bigger than the government, you follow what I'm saying? So it states here in the minute, a well-regulated militia is, the ne is necessary for the security of a free state. So it's, it, it's in our amendment. We have to have a militia. And remember I said 1933, the Army tried to say after World War I, we don't need the National Guard anymore. Let's just make them a reserve of the Army. Because you know, sometimes the, the regular Army gets upset with us because they tell us to go some, we tell them to go fly a cop. Because I work for the governor. I work for the citizens of Indiana. So I want you to know that sentence of a, well, we all think of the Second Amendment, that part is the right of the people to bear arms shall never be infringed, but we also cannot ever take a, a, a militia away from the state. Now, of interest, I haven't told you this. The federal government does have a lot of control over me as the Adjutant General. Why? 96% of the budget that I had to run the Indiana National Guard came from the federal government. The state of Indiana only gave me four. I only got about $20 million a year from, from our General Assembly. I got over 500. But that's to pay for, for the soldiers, all their training, all that. But it's a pretty good deal for government, for our military, because you basically got, yeah, to give you an idea, a guardsman cost about one third of the regular army person. And they've taken this, they've taken a guy in a 20 year career, blah, 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 another guy 20 years. So for 30 cents on the dollar, you basically get someone that's got the same equipment, trained level, so we, but you only have to use them when you need them. The rest of the time, you put them back on the shelf and they become citizens. And that's still the basis of our country. Citizens first, soldier second. George Washington said that. I'm a citizen first, I'm a soldier second. He's proud as he was to be a citizen. He's more proud as he was a citizen. So it's, it's a great concept. That, does that answer your question? Any other questions? Absolutely superb. I make this statement. I will be back someday. Here we go, I'm a partner. I'm going to be